Welcome back to the 2018 Hack Summit. We are privileged to be here with Kapil KK Jane, as well as Steve Jurvetson, who and, and Kapil is launching a brand new startup company out of stealth mode here at Hack Summit. It's an exclusive opportunity for you to learn about his new initiative. And to give you some background about Kapil, Kapil previously served on the faculty of the Stanford School of Engineering, where he ran the Mathematical and Computational Finance Program. And he taught courses and he led a research group there on advanced financial technologies, uh, blockchains and cryptocurrencies. And uh, he's a recognized thought leader in the space, a quant expert, and, and we're super privileged to have him here. He's the CEO and founder of Encent. And then Steve Jurvetson is a world-renowned venture capitalist who will be interviewing Kapil on camera here. So they're here together. And, and Steve, in case you don't know him, he is uh, the co-founder and former partner at, at DFJ, Draper Fitcher Jurvetson, which is a world-renowned venture capital firm here. He has a new venture capital firm that he started recently as well. And he sits on the board of SpaceX and Tesla. He's been on the Forbes Midas list, which is a list of like the best investors in Silicon Valley and around the world. He invested early into Hotmail, and he's also an engineer, just like us. So he has a double lead degree from Stanford, where he graduated with honors. And so, Steve, it's a pleasure to meet you and to have you here as well here, Kapil. And I'll let you guys do your interview. Have a lot of fun with it, and I'll be right here in case you need me. Fantastic. Thank you so much, and thanks for having us. Can great. Hear, thanks, Ed. Yeah. Assuming you can hear us okay, text us if you can't at any point. You sound great. Uh, fantastic. Well, we're delighted to be here today. We're here in San Francisco, and uh, thematically, we thought it'd be uh, appropriate to sort of go to the moon, given my long fascination with this area. And so we have a few props for you today, obviously, the moonscape behind us. Um, interestingly, just for inspiration, that is the largest slice of the moon on Earth. It literally comes from our moon, larger than any moon rock from the Apollo program. came as a meteorite. It's beautiful. We love that as a theme. And lastly, uh, and we love this gimmick, we have a 3D printed rocket engine from a startup across the bay that's hoping this weekend coming up to uh, put their first payload into space. And so since we're having a fireside chat, we thought, well, uh, you know, we'll actually just have a fireside chat while we speak. So this is going to get pretty hot for us, I just now realized. Um, a warm glow the entire time. Let me move my mic back a little bit. So here we go. This was not planned, by the way. Yeah, this was untested. Let's just put it that way. Um, proximity of face to fire. Um, but yeah, most, most modern rocket engines are 3D printed because inside of here you have regenerative cooling uh, channels and such that are hard to cast. So that's uh, not what we're here to talk about today. Today we're here to talk about Encent, and this is also quite special because this is the first public appearance of any kind that the company is making. So this is the first time people like you can ask questions and hear about the Encent story. I'm pretty excited about that myself. And there's also an additional thing today. They are announcing their first round of funding, a $10 million seed round with a pretty illustrious group of investors. We have Naval Bravikant, who I'm a huge fan of. We have Sequoia, and SV Angel, and AME Cloud, which is Jerry Yang's fund, the Winklevi, or the Winklevoss Partners, Floodgate, Zen Fund, and a bunch of others. In fact, a large number of other investors. Um, and so this is an exciting day for the company to have its beginning of its debut, uh, or at least uh, announcing of what it is doing in the world. Right? Sure. And I can add uh, one other investor uh, as well, uh, Steve Jurvetson, right. of course. Um, and uh, for those of you who don't know, Steve obviously doesn't need uh, any introduction uh, in the Valley uh, and has been a, a great supporter. So thank you, uh, Steve. And uh, there's also a bit of a uh, news. I know Steve's uh, pretty modest about it, but there's also some great news on Steve's side where he's uh, actually launching Future Ventures, uh, a venture uh, uh, capital fund that uh, we're proud to be part of uh, the blockchain family of. Fantastic. Thank you, KK. So um, we also are going to spend some time describing what Encent is all about and the problems it aims to solve and the opportunities uh, to use the blockchain in particular, or to use the crypto technologies to address some really huge unmet needs in the economy, some that are dear to my heart as well. So as we get into it, maybe I'll start with a very broad question. How would you describe what Incent is all about and what you're aiming to do at the simple level? We'll get into more details later of the history sure. and problems, but it, you know, just nutshell so people have a placeholder. What is it that, that Incent's all about? Yeah, sure. So uh, we like to describe Incent as a decentralized protocol for incentive markets. Um, and incentive markets, we think, are a super exciting category of blockchain or decentralized applications um, that folks up until now have not been very focused on. Um, and an incentive market is quite simple. Um, it's an efficient way for people to collaborate and have the value of their work and collaboration be rewarded. Uh, and that ends up um, creating the substrate of incentives that allows markets to form. 
Um, and I think, you know, as we know from Econ 101, um, the two best ways to organize people are sort of firms and markets. Um, and, you know, firms in many cases are all we have. Uh, oftentimes they're inefficient. Uh, the incentives of individuals inside of a firm can be broken or misaligned. Uh, and firms may even be misaligned with their users or their customers. Um, and so what we're trying to do is to create a platform that's decentralized that allows market forces to enter into uh, uh, the organizational structures or principles uh, that typically have been um, the, the dominion of firms. And we can talk about examples of that, but um, there's lots of different ways um, to kind of disaggregate or um, really uh, uh, break apart um, the, the elements of what makes uh, incentives form for people to collaborate together. And that's really kind of what we're focused on. We have a laser-like focused uh, focus on incentives and hence the name Encent Labs. <laughs> exactly, in fact, that might be a good segue a bit to your background because as I listen to this, I, I think thoughts around economic systems, thoughts around uh, obviously incentives and motivations, but also how, how do markets form? What makes for liquidity markets? What makes for stability in markets? What makes for um, a thriving economy? And so maybe you can dive a little bit more than we heard just a moment ago in terms of your background, because it's quite interesting. Uh, in fact, KK and I first met, um, or first time we met in great depth, we were on a stage at Stanford at a um, AI and financial technologies conference that he helped organize and moderate. Um, and that was fascinating on its own right. We've since kept up since then. And uh, I often, when I find someone who combines two backgrounds that are very different, um, not the usual combination or pairing that you, you might find just walking down the street, I, I, I pay keener attention. because That's usually where the big ideas come from, the sort of inter, interdisciplinary ideas that, that cross boundaries. So maybe give a little more background on what inspired your personal path and what inspired you in that personal path and then transition into uh, starting uh, Ensign. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, would love to uh, kind of introduce a little bit of my background. Um, you know, when I was a kid, I, I, I sort of was very fortunate to see kind of um, personal computing uh, be one of the formative trends of my kind of childhood. Uh, and then to see sort of the internet and then later on, of course, mobile. So these are sort of like the formative years where I sort of had these uh, inspiring thoughts or dreams about sort of the promise of personal computing and the internet to really connect people and sort of democratize opportunity, uh, spread information um, and, you know, make the world a bit fairer in that regard. Um, I was kind of a, a Mac geek growing up. Um, so like many, I think young people, that was the first exposure to a development environment, uh, just kind of in my local public school. Um, and uh, I actually ended up going to, uh, to Dartmouth because it was a Macified campus. Uh, they That's actually had, yeah, <laughs> that and they offered me the most financial aid. So. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, I was really inspired by uh, Apple and it was kind of during my undergraduate years that they went through some uh, tough times and Steve Jobs came back. Uh, and I remember actually sitting in uh, one of my clubs with one of my, one of my classmates who was also kind of a Mac guy. Uh, and we saw the big screen of Bill Gates show up ominously. And then <laughs> they announced that Microsoft is bailing them out. And then, you know, our initial reaction is kind of a Mac, Mac faithful was a little bit to be down. Um, but then we sort of had this strange idea that we should all just go work for Microsoft because in order for the Mac to succeed, they needed Office to be an awesome product. And we just didn't trust that Microsoft would deliver it. Um, so a bunch of my friends ended up like interning at Microsoft. Um, and uh, a, a funny thing happened. It was a great experience to, to be a kid. You know, we were the largest Mac development team outside of Apple. Um, and I remember actually one of the internships, you know, got to meet Steve Jobs. So I think a lot of people in the Valley have this experience of I like, too. I worked the next basically. Oh, really? What was, what was your was experience? Um, the, five, the long walks, the sort of this, he was possessed by Apple. I think he still at next. He was just possessed by Apple. He had like chiseled the icon out of his keyboard. He, he was just <laughs> fanatical about coming back to Apple. And I didn't think it was possible when we were next as an enterprise software company at the time. And sure enough, it played out exactly the way he thought it would. Mm -hmm. He was just sort of uh, silently attending uh, a sort of review, but his, uh, 
uh, even in silence, his, his presence was basically uh, uh, felt in the room. But anyway, um, you know, uh, long story short, one of the things that I ended up doing uh, while I was at uh, Microsoft as an intern is it was kind of the first time in my life that I had a little bit of money to play with. Um, and like every dot com 1.0 kid who was clueless, I ended up day trading Internet stocks, <laughs> um, which in retrospect was just some kind of weak form of gambling. Um, but, you know, I ended up sort of it's topical, topical for some in the audience. Topical for some <laughs> in, in crypto now. Um, but, um, uh, you know, that was sort of an experience where I actually didn't know that you could do this for a living. Uh, and I was just sort of screwing around uh, and made a little bit of money, which at the time was all the money in the world to me. Um, and sort of had this circuitous path to Wall Street. Um, I ended up getting recruited by a company called uh, D.E. Shaw, um, which was a quant hedge fund. Um, and, you know, I didn't really know anything about finance before that. Uh, you know, they sort of paid me more money than Microsoft. <laughs> and I was sort of like on my way in terms of a Wall Street career. Uh, but I always sort of felt that um, kind of like Wall Street picked me. I didn't necessarily like affirmatively pick Wall Street. Um, but having said that, you know, I learned a ton and I'm super, super grateful uh, for my experience there. Um, and, you know, I really learned a lot about statistical arbitrage, what makes markets work, um, how to model markets and how to develop, um, you know, safe and secure code at scale to be able to engage in financial transactions. Um, and so it was a very fertile kind of learning environment for me in my career. Um, I, uh, so I had a 10 year career on Wall Street. I actually had a brief cameo where I was at uh, Stanford uh, in a grad program. Uh, which I thought was a good hedge to actually creating a hedge fund because uh, <laughs> if the fund worked out as a startup, hedging you know, I was hedging my hedge fund by enrolling in a you know, stats program at Stanford. <laughs> so I was in my dorm room at Reigns being a stat arbitrator and then pretended to take, um, you know, the PhD first year curriculum and then uh, uh, ended up kind of just going back to Wall Street um, and uh, worked at Perry Capital, which was a large hedge fund and ran a multi-billion dollar quad portfolio there. And then I was thankful um, uh, to have the opportunity to run the uh, city principal strategies prop desk and the quant business there, um, which was a which was a huge business. Um, and you know what? After after sort of ten years uh, of doing that, um, you know, I just sort of sort of took back a step back and kind of just went through this internal thought process of concluding that sort of, you know, I think a lot of a lot of people, especially young people coming out of college they sort of end up being good at something and they just kind of go into that track. And then eventually you kind of realize or you analyze from first principles your life and you sort of think like, well, why did I actually do that? Um, what was the kind of mm -hmm. rationale behind it? Um, and I sort of ended up having this analogy uh, uh, in my mind of uh, the kind of Mouse Olympics. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was the first time in my life I kind of like looked at myself in the mirror and was like, well, you know, I was very successful and very thankful for the opportunities that I got. Uh, but I think kind of a career on Wall Street is some kind of form of like playing the Mouse Olympics. Um, and, you know, every year you get a bonus, you do you do better, you get a bigger team, you get more capital to manage. Uh, and these are all kind of like gold medals along the way of the Mouse Olympics. But, you know, as the line sort of goes, uh, you know, even if you win all the gold medals at the Mouse Olympics, at the end of the day, you're still an effing mouse. <laughs> um, so it sort of like took me 10 years to realize I was kind of playing the Mouse Olympics. Um, and then so I sort of stepped back. Um, I really wanted to give back uh, by teaching. Um, and I actually uh, was inspired to try and teach um, in sort of disadvantaged high school situations. Uh, it turns out it's actually very difficult uh, from a licensure standpoint. Uh, for those of you who know Michelle Pfeiffer, my goal was to be like Michelle Pfeiffer in Dangerous Minds. <laughs> um, and um, uh, it turns I mean, in the movie, she just walked into the school and started teaching, but you know, it doesn't really happen like that. Uh, but teach for America. yeah, Teach for America would have been another one. But um, anyway, long story short, I ended up talking to my old advisor uh, at Stanford, and he was like, well, why don't you just come teach here? We'll let anyone teach here. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 <laughs> uh, so I ended up, uh, you know, having a, a, a faculty appointment in the engineering school. Uh, I ran the computational finance program there, and it really gave me, uh, number one, uh, a front row seat to the kind of innovative fervor that I experienced uh, in the first dot-com boom when I was out here, um, uh, kind of in this, like, the spirit of, like, this mech 
uh, Mac community, where it was sort of like being part of a movement that was larger than yourself, that was technology based. You as a developer can actually like make a difference. It's literally like your fingers typing code into a computer can mm -hmm. like make an impact. Right. Um, and you know, so like on Wall Street, right, all your wins are private. It's essentially your monetizing all the gifts you've been given gifts of you know intellect and grit and whatever just to sort of like monetize your brain and so i really miss this idea of like you can actually contribute to something you know bigger bigger than yourself um and so you know being able to have the opportunity to come back here uh and being involved was, was really great and then it also gave me a lot of freedom uh to run a, a kind of blockchain research group um at Stanford, um, which, you know, was sort of a, a great opportunity to help me develop my ideas and my thinking um, about uh, about blockchain. Um, it also helps uh, tapping an initial pool of uh, talent uh, potentially to recruit. Uh, to your yeah, team. I mean, look, I think that um, the space is uh, really changing super, super fast. I mean, it's often mm -hmm. stated that, you know, a week in blockchain feels like a few months uh, in some other sector. I think that's certainly true. And there's a lot of really good research and creativity at Stanford um, that we're certainly tapping into. Um, we're really blessed to have, you know, wonderful advisors and contributors. Um, uh, David Mazziera is the chief scientist at Stellar and I making mean, it on the list, but um, we're really blessed to be plugged into that cutting edge research community. Um, in the Bay Area, I think there's um, really, um, you know, a really fertile environment uh, for people to develop products. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of institutional knowledge about scaling and how you develop technology to be impactful on an internet and worldwide scale. So we're very blessed to be a part of that. I noticed you formed a Telegram group um, yeah. and it went from zero to 9,000 people in a week before you had said a word much about what you're doing other than come join us, you know, um, we're doing something interesting and maybe word of mouth among your interns. Um, how did you pull that off? Do you have some sort of amazing community manager? It's actually like not as uh, not as sophisticated as well, as one would think for an incentive community. Um, we just sort of created this Telegram site and just asked people that we knew. We didn't even email all of our investors yet, or we didn't really tell anyone about it yet. And it just sort of grew organically. Um, actually, we wanted to design a new logo. So the T-shirts that I'm, I have now is our old logo that an inter intern created. Uh, Farah, so thanks Farah for creating this logo. What we wanted to do is refresh the logo and we thought it'd be fun to sort of crowdsource it and it's just sort of one thing's become a, to another. Um, but I do think our key secret weapon in uh, building out our Telegram community, I would encourage everyone to join, uh, NCNT is our Telegram um, uh, name, um, has been our community manager. Uh, so we did appoint a, uh, a worldwide community manager uh, about three days ago. Uh, and I think we actually uh, have him right here. <laughs> Oh yeah. <laughs> so this is the the world famous uh, this is the world famous popcorn. Uh, his name is Porter Cornelius, but he goes by Popcorn, and he's our uh, office uh, golden doodle. Uh, and so he has been uh, really gotten kind of internet famous uh, on um, on uh, on our Telegram, and so kind of by popular fan demand, uh, you know, he's uh, making a cameo still a here. Puppy? Is he? He's still a puppy. Um, Crypto puppy. He's a, he's definitely one of our crypto puppies. So. <laughs> <laughs> he's soft. He's quite nice. Yeah. So he's a, he is a golden doodle and we uh, kind of, uh, he's gonna eventually be a big ass dog. He's going to be a pretty big dog. It's like a 50 pound dog, but we kind of, uh, saved him from a bad situation. And now he's, uh, kind of surrounded by love, uh, not only in the office, but with the, uh, tens of thousands of adoring fans online. <laughs> Surprised with, you know, fire and being on stage, no stage fright. Yeah, we didn't we didn't practice this with the fire, so that's kind of a new <laughs> variable for the puppy to to grok. It's, you know, it's like the old tradition. You know, the <laughs> Fantastic! I'm glad he's here for our fireside chat. Yeah, uh, so he's definitely a, a key team member, um, and uh, uh, you know, kind of a having about here. It's a little bit clickbaity, but uh, it's a bit of our uh, it's a bit of our homage to our colleague Sebastian Thrun, who famously went on TechCrunch with his puppy. <laughs> I that. So Sebastian, if you're watching, uh, you know, say hi to Charlie. There you go. Well, fantastic. Well, maybe um, that could segue uh, going to some of the timeline of development and 
there was, I know an inspirational moment for you because I read your blog post about it and I spoke with you about it before investing about the DARPA Red Balloon Challenge. Yeah. And, um, I had not heard of this prior to you introducing it to me and maybe you can introduce it to the audience as well as to uh, what this is all about and what it managed to achieve. Yeah, so I think that uh, this uh, DARPA Red Balloon Challenge was kind of one of the core pieces of the founding uh, kernels of idea for me anyway. Um, and it was just sort of this quirky story um, uh, that ended up inspiring me really for the last, you know, almost decade now. Um, and uh, the story begins in 2009 uh, when DARPA, uh, you know, for those of you who aren't familiar with DARPA, it's the um, uh, U.S. Department of Defense's Advanced Research Projects Group, uh, and they often do research challenges. Um, and uh, they challenge academics or other community uh, folks to come up with innovative solutions. Uh, they very famously had a uh, self-driving car contest um, uh, in, uh, in the desert, which was a, a, a really inspiring uh, kind of watershed moment for that, that community. Um, and there was one kind of a little bit lesser known uh, in 2009, they had uh, the so-called Red Balloon Challenge. Um, and it was a pretty modest contest. Uh, what the formulation of it was, um, they offered $40,000 as a reward uh, for people to find 10 red balloons that they had placed all over the map, all over the country. Anywhere in the US. Anywhere in the US. So they didn't tell you anything about where they were. You got a photo of the red balloon. So it was like a moored weather balloon. Then you describe, I thought something. this might be a fun pause. Once you describe the challenge, have people think how long do they think it takes to solve this challenge? Yeah, it? yeah, and then, and then reveal. How long yeah, so there's so just just imagine the entire. Uh, it could be anywhere in America. And men, remember in 2009, this is before you had like quasi real time satellite imaging or the ability to do some kind of computer revision. This is like a hard physical search, like needle in the haystack type problem. And in fact, many of the people that were the critics of the pro problem. There was actually an article where people were famously talking about how this is actually like a needle in the haystack problem. It's like not even worth doing or another it line of, kind of it kind of like an impossible task or another um, a criticism was that $40,000 actually wasn't enough of an incentive because uh, you might consider, for example, having a whole team kind of screening or careening the whole um, uh, like the, like the fields of Nebraska <laughs> uh, trying to find these uh, red balloons. And it really was, even though it was kind of a fun game or a formulation, it was really mimicking like real problems. Um, so one of the kind of stylized canonical use cases of something like this or analogies is, you know, like if there's a missing child or a missing person. Collective mobilization. Um, collective mobilization and sort of it's like an ad hoc social network. Um, and there's sort of elements of virality in it. So studying how this kind of information propagates uh, is important. Um, <clears throat> you know, there's so much um, uh, uh, noise and uh, well information out there that's competing for our attention. So being able to get through uh, and, and, and craft the incentives around a campaign such that it breaks through that attention barrier so that people are focusing on it so the information can truly propagate. Um, another use case is sort of, you know, finding the bad guys, finding the most wanted um, uh, uh, person. But anyway, why don't I tell you a little bit about um, uh, the sort of um, uh, solution. So, um, uh, I MIT- there were, I read there were like 4,000 sort of attempts and then a few hundred that really made a go of it. I recall. And then what, MIT? Yeah, so the MIT team eventually ended up solving it. And actually, Ed, if we could throw up a poll, uh, maybe some of you guys know about the Red Balloon Challenge, but uh, maybe we can do a poll to guess how long it took the MIT team. Uh, so do we, to, let, maybe we have to get buckets so people can vote uh, binary. Do you want to do like less than a day, a week, a month? Um, yeah. How about less than a day, a week, or a month? Uh, I think those are the poll right now. And, and don't know, week. you can vote if you know the answer, but that'll just be biasing it. <laughs> Maybe only vote if you haven't heard this before. So, tell me yeah. um, so before we get, we'll give you a little, the poll may take a sec to, to actually pull together. Let's see, I don't see poll yet. So, um, so let, let's, let's, before we get, reveal the results, Maybe mention because I think you can say how they approached it. What they, right? You want to describe yeah. how the MIT team approached yeah. it? Yeah. So it's relevant. The reason we're giving this example is it's directly relevant to what motivated the founding of Vincent in the first place. Yeah, for sure. So um, you know, and, and actually, the solution was something that I was fascinated about when they postulated the solution. And I think part of the reason why I got so obsessed with it is because um, I was sort of like 
um, recruited into this. And so I was really focused on it and I was planning to help out the team, mm -hmm. except for like I was at work or whatever. And like <laughs> they saw the, and um, you know, there, it sort of was something where um, it was, um, uh, you know, uh, my personal involvement ended up kind of making me like uh, more obsessed with it than the average bear, I think. Um, and their approach was to um, crowdsource support off of the internet, um, which in and of itself wasn't novel. There were a couple of other teams that did that in different formulations. Um, but what they did is they were really um, hacking incentives. Um, so they really thought about, hey, how can we take this $40,000 pool that's gonna be the prize and um, sort of create the right incentive structure um, that not only rewards uh, the people that find the balloon, sort of the naive solution is, okay, let's, let's reward the people that find the balloon, um, um, open that just for a little cold air. Yeah. yeah. And we had to uh, cool down the rocket engine. It's, it's sort of radiant yeah. heat continues uh, long after it stops burning. A, it's, yeah. a, it's, a, it's a cooled out sequence. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Thank you. Um, and um, so, you know, what was really inspiring to me is um, they actually kind of gave a thoughtful incentive structure for people to propagate information about the network and about the formulation. Um, and so, um, you know, what, what ended up happening, I, I can just describe the algorithm a little bit. Um, they sort of had $40,000 was the total reward that the MIT team was going to get from DARPA if they were able to solve the, solve the problem. And what they did was uh, they divided that into 10 buckets because there were 10 balloons. And they basically said each balloon will be worth $4,000. And so let's just algorithmically call 4,000 equals N. Um, and then their advertising campaign or their pitch was sort of come all kind of join our red balloon hunting team. And if you find the solution, you get N over two. Um, so, so that's your reward. So $2,000. Um, and uh, there's also going to be incentive for you to propagate information about this campaign. And so if you tell your friends about it and one of your friends ends up finding the solution, that person gets n over four. And if you find the finder, you get n over eight, n over 16. So they use a so-called recursive and incentive in limit, structure. It won't add up to more than 40,000, right. no matter how deep this goes, right? Yep, yep, yep. yep. So it's, it, a recursive, it, yeah. it's a recursive structure that converges. And this convergence property ends up being super important uh, because you want to design something where uh, the network can generate enough value uh, to pay off all of the participants. Uh, and so people intuitively trusted the MIT team to make good on their promises. There was no sort of community default risk associated with uh, MIT. So MIT was a trusted central actor sponsoring this uh, contest. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, it sort of was a <coughs> very elegant uh, uh, solution um, to this problem that had um, some pretty interesting mathematical properties. Um, so there's a whole bunch of papers written after that. Uh, event or after that result, um, you can you know, just mention um, that if people online don't know how to do the poll, there's a little button at the, or word poll at the bottom that showed up. And if you click on that once, you, you'll be able to vote if you want to add your votes, because in, in a moment here, it will reveal the answer. So if you just want to go through the exercise yourself of, you know, trying to think how long do I think this would take to propagate and find a solution across the entire United States? But go ahead. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Um, so it was really remarkable. So basically like you got a reward for finding the solution and then essentially you got a reward if the solution appeared in your subtree. Um, so you can think of it as sort of creating a tree and a social deep in theory. It could be infinitely deep. And the cool thing is uh, with this type of structure and they, there was a post-mortem paper afterwards is that, you know, everyone found the balloon that was sort of like in Chicago or, you know, one of the um, uh, areas where it was easier to find the balloons it really outperforms search wise is these sort of deep tails um, where maybe you require multiple hops to try and find them or it's a more idiosyncratic. Um, um, uh, and there's all kinds of um, interesting ideas uh, that came out to me or why I became inspired by it. Um, and so, you know, one of the ideas from my youth is really that like, um, you know, I, I used to read a lot about like, like Doug Engelbart, who was a Turing oh, Award winner. Before we get there, because it's killing me. We got to do the reveal. Okay. Go on, on. People are like, <laughs> so just a little, we'll, we'll wrap up the polling, at least the summary. It looks like the majority of people, the modal answer is about less than a week. So more than a day, less than a week was a single most popular vote, about 43%. About a third of you, uh, less than a third, thought that it actually could be done in less than a day. 
Some, um, maybe almost, uh, almost equal amount thought it was more, more like month to year kind of time frame. So do you want to reveal? Yeah, okay. it was, it was less than nine hours. Yeah, um, within, within nine hours. Yeah. And so, in fact, I actually was not able to add any value because it was solved <laughs> faster than I could do anything. So, yeah. <laughs> um, so I don't want to claim credit for any of it. I wasn't part of the core team. It was out of um, uh, Sandy Plantin and Manuel Sebrian out of MIT in the Media Lab there uh, and their research group that ran it. I was just sort of a fan or spectator that kind of got obsessed with this uh, result mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and try to figure out what is the, and there's a lot of subtlety and complexity involved in this. So, um, you know, one of the kind of like, dreams of the internet, I think, for me, as I was saying, is sort of like the internet's kind of connected people, um, but unlocking our common potential um, is something that's a little bit of a of an unfulfilled promise. We've only begun to scratch the yeah, surface you're of to say it. That some of the early founding visions of what the internet should enable. Yeah. Um, I, I remember when I was working at Next and you, and you were at Microsoft that uh, dot uh, net and some other vaporware was being discussed and i really came increasingly to believe that a large part of the value of these infrastructure layers whether it's blockchain whether it's uh, other protocols people are trying to promulgate are largely directory and search how do i find what i'm looking for and also how do i get paid directory search and, and payments and um, when you're developing nested code like an object-oriented framework like next was working on you would ideally want to be able to pay an infinitely deep tree if you will or or perhaps a cyclic graph either one of um, contributors. And how could one do that in a very efficient manner? It was mm -hmm. intriguing. I also wrote some papers on blockchain back, actually not blockchain, on digital cash back in 94, believe it or not, where, where this is what fascinated me. It fascinated me when Hotmail came around and Skype, which we invested in, and the whole term viral marketing that I actually coined with my partner, Tim. Um, and so I've been fascinated at the power of, this, basically what's endemic to the internet itself, what Kevin Kelly would say is the inevitable trajectory of this technology is towards distributed systems, towards nested and recursive incentive systems and unlocking the power and potential. You, you'll see that in the gig economy. You'll see that uh, mm -hmm. in some areas where there's no payment, it's just reputational capital perhaps mm -hmm. it's accumulating. But if you could layer on an infrastructure layer to address that in mm -hmm. some sense, you could unlock sort of the main untapped potential of the internet, at least in my opinion. Yeah, for sure. I mean, one of the things that we like to say is sort of like if aliens came down from Mars and they sort of saw Bill Gates and they saw Linus Torvalds, and they were sort of saying that like, okay, like Bill Gates is like the richest guy or maybe one of the richest guys in the world. And Linus is sort of like a, a, a modest open source, like mega hacker. But the value attribution is a little bit strange because like you could probably argue that Linux was at least as impactful as Windows was as an operating system. Uh, but the world's value attribution, uh, particularly in open source, is something that's always been a little bit of a of a head scratcher. We haven't actually solved incentives for open source development. And I think that a lot of people that do open source development aren't really doing it necessarily for like the payday. But the point is, if you can somehow have some incentive market and some incentive market forces enter something as simple as, for example, open source development, you might be able to broaden the pie of people for whom it's worthwhile to contribute to open source um, development. So open source is something that one may not consider it to be a broken market, but it's an opportunity to expand that market uh, to be able to touch people that <coughs> don't have the luxury of of just kind of contributing to open source development for like you know hacker karma points. Right. Um, uh, and so one of the things that really struck me about the Red Balloon Challenge was it's exploiting private information that people knew about each other. Like I may have my friend may have a hunch that like. KK is really, really into something like this red balloon stuff. I don't know why, but he just likes kind of puzzles or games of this nature. So this would be right up his alley. So you don't even necessarily need to even know the model. Your brain doesn't actually even have to grok the model of why, mm -hmm. but there's this huge treasure trove of data and information in our brains that we know about each other. Mm -hmm. I mean, human beings are social creatures and we have a hunch of each other's potential, their capabilities, their skills, what their you know, uh, ideals are. And so all of that is essentially going untapped. Only a small fraction of that even appears online. Mm -hmm. um, so even Facebook, if it had a super targeted ad campaign where it literally just took everyone's profile, sucked it all in, put it into some machine learning algorithm, I don't think it would have been able to solve the Red Balloon Challenge in less than nine hours. It was exploiting private information that people had. And there was this also aspect of geographic diversity. Right. You wanted to recruit friends from different regions in America because that's how the problem, um, it would, uh, it would 
<coughs> maximize the problem. So all of these things were capitalistic or economic distribution of value add that someone on the edge can figure out where on the edge to explore that's underexploited. Everyone could be making a local optimization decision mm -hmm. where they could find the most untapped potential like mm -hmm. an exploration of the landscape, mm -hmm. literally in this case. And they don't even need to, it's it's sort of like um, the hardest crypto is the crypto that's sort of like information that's encrypted in your brain. And like, you actually can't even explain the model. Like, I, I don't, I like, like, you know, if I saw some like, uh, uh, like cool space object, I might have a hunch that Steve might be interested in it. Um, Maybe in the second floor, I think there's a big window open and things are blowing over. You know, we have some <laughs> airflow issues that are knocking things over in the distance. Um, sorry about that. It's probably like a, a jet engine vortex, uh, exactly. you know, in the, in the shutdown procedure of the uh, of the engine. But um, so, so how about, uh, this is one area that we've explored a bit. Are there others like in certain areas of markets? There's advertising. There, I'm thinking recruiting, uh, matchmaking in general. Yeah, this is where like uh, my fiance works in in a recruiting business, using AI to help you know companies build up their uh, teams. And the idea of who best can find mm -hmm. a match for a given opportunity, we all know this in our in our hearts that the easiest time building a company is time is someone you know, at least yeah. the first few people and then the people they know and, and so forth because of that. Yeah, person. totally. I mean, so it's, 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 it's sort of like, so what is the status quo? We have this dream of the internet. It's connected us for sure, but it has not uh, unlocked our common potential. And like the biggest companies are the biggest central actors that have the deep enough pockets or the enough eyeballs uh, and enough users and enough user data to organize people are just simply kind of like not really incentivized to do this. Um, sort of like, the, first of all, I think, you know, one of the things that people misunderstand about blockchain is, um, yeah, there's sort of a distributed systems uh, component to this and decentralization as a trend, but it's also a new way to set up an organization and you can set up the initial conditions of the organization so everyone's aligned and incentivized on tokens, on a tokenized network. Um, you know, you look at something like Facebook or Google, where you sort of have the shareholders as the benevolent caretakers, so to speak, of uh, the user network, but they're not quite benevolent because they're for-profit shareholders. They have a duty and a fiduciary to maximize profits, which is naturally going to fall out of alignment with its users. And so at scale, this alignment is just going to naturally fall farther and farther apart. So, you know, I think a lot of these controversies that we're seeing about Facebook and so forth, you know, maybe it's just an initial condition design flaw of how they're set up from an incentive structure vis-a-vis -vis their user network. And Facebook is an interesting example because it's like, you know, like Steve and I have a natural social connection. We have natural, so like, you know, like what is more fundamental for like human ownership than like owning your social graph, you're owning your social network. It actually exists in real life. It's just that like, we all can't figure out how to create the digital representation of that online. So we're like defer to Facebook to figure out the protocol of how to do that. Right. And then in exchange, they're able to like extract all this economic rent off of us. Generally, um, would applaud this. I can, I can tell you. He's, yeah. he's been ranting about this for a while. Like, yeah. So, <laughs> people for their contributions. Yeah. So yeah. the upshot of all of this is these centralized actors are rapidly kind of like losing trust uh, and they're not motivated um, to solve this problem of unlocking our common potential necessarily. And what you're left with is just like broken markets everywhere. So, uh, you know, like you were just talking about ads. I mean, ads is like literally the market it's like been the same way on the internet for like 20 years it's just been like the engine that's been and they're like super spammy they're super inefficient from an information content standpoint it's like a super expensive way to acquire customers um <clears throat> and yet like you know this powers you know most of the you know pnl off of the internet you know recruiting is another one i mean i think that um you know i think myself steve of course a lot of people that are probably tuning in we're really really blessed to have our careers and our chosen profession be fulfilling to our kind of intrinsic potential. And like the reality is for 99% of people in the world, that's just not the case. They kind of just check in, get paid and like, you know, check out. And so we're starting to see kind of the rise of the, the gig economy. And, you know, even the early green shoots of the gig economy are kind of like a little bit centralized and, you know, it'll be interesting to see how that goes. But um, the idea is, you know, these are kind of like broken markets that, you know, if we can kind of create an incentive market around um, <clears throat> and set up those initial conditions of incentives properly, you know, maybe that composes into something where we can unlock some of this potential um, and address things like uh, a smarter way to acquire customers or a smarter way to um, <clears throat> uh, recruit people. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's really just 
quite simple. I mean, we know a lot of valuable information about each other and that potential is not really unlocked. And so if you can just create the right incentives around it, you can let a market form. And when markets form, I mean, this is another one of the rallying cries of the internet of technology. It just allows market forces to enter into places that have just been ossified by firms. You know, if you look at, for example, Uber or, uh, you know, deconstructing uh, 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 taxis or Airbnb, you know, deconstructing hotels, you know, just good things seem to happen when you allow market forces to enter into and the technology can enable. So on the second floor, a big slider, a glass slider. You, can close it. It's, you have to go towards the backyard. So there's a, a huge noise that, that we're trying to address. Um, and I'll come do it if you can't. Um, Again, uh, I think it's another side from God yeah, that I've uh, really so. right now. Sorry about that. Let, let's shift gears because I'm noticing the time. Um, yeah. Let's talk about the blockchain and, yeah. and obviously and how that uh, applies here. Now we've, we've set up the, just one second. Uh, I'm gonna ask the question and let you answer it. Um, yeah, sure. Uh, the question is, how does this map to the blockchain? Everything from the ledger to you know elements of distributed trust, and and why might the elements of what we learn from the crypto you know, world apply to everything we just been talking about? Yeah, sure, sure. And so I think one of the analogies, actually, I, I was tuning into the Crypto Kitties uh, presentation, and I think they actually had a very clear slide where it sort of said the internet has connected us. Uh, but blockchain is really the substrate for us to collaborate. Uh, so if you go back to this MIT example, <coughs> people just sort of took the centralized trust of MIT. Um, but you know, what if you actually had this on a decentralized or trustless way? So you didn't actually have to trust anyone. Um, we could guarantee convergence. We can guarantee that the value will be attributed to you as a matter of mathematical protocol. Um, so you can just sort of like download, it's open source, you can download the code and convince yourself that it's convergent, uh, that uh, you can audit, there's it, it high transparency and high auditability in the chain that you can sort of see the transactions are sort of uh, uh, being routed or being allocated properly. And even more fundamental than that, it's sort of like, if you look at the gatekeepers now, the large companies, right? You as a user might get value from a market across across uh, uh, many of them. However, they have no incentive to actually do that. Um, and so um, imagine a way that I can do sort of like distributed exchange of incentives from party A uh, to party B and I can extract the value of them and without party A and party B being in a trusted relationship with each other. Facebook and Google are never gonna trust each other. <laughs> um, but you know, there, maybe there's a way to compose these uh, on a blockchain so that um, you, know, you can create this ecosystem uh, where it can operate um, operate trustlessly, um, and so that's that's uh, that's part of the vision. Um, but tell us um, how you're going to build this. What's the uh, what's the plan of how you get from here to there? I'm yeah, really curious about that. Yeah, yeah. So this is uh, this is a lot of fun. And by the way, um, uh, just as a little bit of a plug, uh, you know, we are hiring. Uh, so please, you know, feel free to email me at kk at ncnt.io. Uh, you know, if you're interested in any one of these topics, yep, ncnt. <laughs> ncnt.io uh, uh, and also you know you follow us on telegram and uh, and uh, and uh, and twitter and whatnot as well but um really uh, there's really kind of three uh big steps here um one is sort of uh we're, we're launching a new chain um and the difference between our chain and other chains is that our chain is designed from the ground up every design decision is optimized to be able to facilitate incentive markets. So unlike the Turing complete smart contract chains, um, we are sort of <coughs> able to be more specialized around this incentive market use case. So it's a matter of sort of just focus. And we think these incentive markets can be widely applicable to lots of different categories. And so we think by focusing and I mean, the reality is on some level, it's, it's a bit of like a, uh, you know, like a bit of a mundane task from an implementation standpoint. It's sort of like accounting value attribution is just sort of like accounting. But if you get that right, you can unlock all this other stuff on top of it. Um, so, um, uh, so that's, uh, you know, you know the, the first kind of like substrate what we're doing. The second is um, we're, uh, you know, sort of we, we won't, you know, I think anyone who's building a protocol has to be really, really driven by building great tools for developers. You know, that's why we're here um, and we really want to uh, kind of project sort of an API first, uh, having very thoughtful SDKs uh, of our products and having great libraries 
uh, that compose into launch applications. Um, some of the initial launch applications uh, that we're going to market with are around customer acquisition. Um, sort of how can you incentivize a community to find a customer? Um, typically, these a good place to start for these ends up being domains that are hugely tribal. So professional sports, for example, um, you know, we have a couple of professional sports owners in our investor group, really tribal brands. We were talking about like LaCroix water earlier or, you know, like Lululemon yoga pants or Subaru cars, just anything that has the property where there's high brand loyalty fanatical and fanatical user base, fanatical user base, where there's sort of <coughs> sort of like the viral network has already the social network the viral uh network has already been sort of uh, uh established mm -hmm. um so you can kind of like uh grok off of it um and, and there's many many other uh use cases there a second thing that we've been doing internally and steve alluded to this earlier is recruiting mm -hmm. um so uh other than one person every single person from ncense uh has been uh recruited using the same dynamics of what we call job job sent uh, which is sort of a uh, recursively incentivizing a large community of developers uh, to help talent uh, come to your company. So if you think about headhunting, it's kind of a strange market. You have a natural social graph of developers, and then you kind of have these like headhunters who kind of like ingratiate themselves with everyone and try and insert themselves into the graph to be able to like extract all this economic rent off of it. But actually, if you sort of like spirited the community of developers themselves and oftentimes just a matching problem, right? You just need to find the right position that matches the interest capabilities and skills of the right person. And if you can kind of like spirit a community of developers, even ones that maybe don't even necessarily want to work here, but they know other people, you know, you could just sort of like have all those incentives um, kind of be like uh, uh, passed back into the community to make the community stronger though, to, to, to uh, augment the community rather than kind of like have this strange like principal agent problem with like headhunters. And this works really with any agent market. Um, and so the recruiting use case is something that we're really grokking for our own internal use. Um, and another internal use um, uh, uh, is, um, <coughs> Uh, you know, this sort of what we call build sent, uh, which is sort of our um, way to incentivize open source development. Um, you know, the reality is I think we as a blockchain can think more about customer acquisition and how we build a user community. I mean, right now, the state of the art in blockchain is like airdrops. And this is something that like, you know, my young daughters could come up with just like, you know, <laughs> dropping blocks. I mean, it, is a, it is a bit disturbing how um, <laughs> tweets, I think it's maybe quarter of all the tweets aimed at me these days or yeah get this great airdrop it's you know good team high quality yeah Same message every time if you have like a like my theory wall you just get like spam with all kinds of like random coins. so it's a little bit like strained and so i think we have to do better i think part of what we want to do for our community is have more thoughtful incentives i mean yeah we'll do something that looks like an airdrop but we want to kind of have kind of a, an incentive substrate to be able to like sort of encourage the right the right things uh and speaking to sort of developers and incentivizing kind of like useful and creative work build challenges another great example of sort of like uh, a version two. stellar for example does amazing build challenges um you know so we're kind of more kind of in that direction and then you know sometimes people ask me like uh every week i do calls uh, on tuesday at six o'clock just open calls with the community who wants to join um and one of the questions i always get asked is sort of like well kk like what are your uh most favorite applications and obviously the jobs one speaks, speaks really hits close to home because that's like our people. So we're sort of like really like that one. Um, but I mean, it sounds kind of corny, but like, you know, we're building a protocol. So we're building tools for developers to create things. And so like our favorite application is sort of like the one that hasn't been developed yet. <laughs> the one that someone's going to pick up with our API and figure out that it, this dynamic works really, really great for XYZ market. And then the challenge is how can we build a community to exchange this information mm -hmm. and sort of like syndicate it, uh, you know, on a global scale. Um, so <clears throat> we obviously had our community manager popcorn uh, here a little bit earlier, um, you know, but uh, up until now, uh, we've kind of been a little bit in hacker mode and, you know, really starting today. Uh, we want to start having a, a more sophisticated message and start opening up to the community a little bit, um, you know, on Telegram and some of the other channels. Um, you know, we hope to have uh, a more vibrant um, uh, uh, a GitHub with some interesting kind of side projects. 
you know, we have this like logo contest, which is just sort of like a way to kind of spirit our community a little bit to, to help us out um, with, with design tasks. But um, it's really at the end of the day going to come down to, uh, we call it NCENT Nation, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and um, kind of empowering uh, developers to want to join NCENT Nation um, and uh, try out your own markets, figure out what works and what doesn't work. And I think, you know, one of the themes that we said before is that, you know, it feels like the early days of the internet and we know that there's something really, really powerful here, but on some level, we're all kind of joined at the hip in this colossal worldwide hunt for like product market fit. Yeah. Um, and so we just are like kind of like setting the substrate and setting the primitives up so we can like cycle really, really quickly and globally exchange all the information mm -hmm. to just get smarter, faster and faster. And so that's a little bit of the, the hope of the community. In the time that remains, I, I want to make sure that we're addressing questions and things that have come up. I noticed in the comments, people piece together finally that incent relates phonetically to incentivize. Right? Yeah. They provide incentives. So just to so help you remember. And yes, uh, yeah. just to address all the rivers, that was a real torch and that was a real fire. <laughs> exactly. And what this thing was, it's a rocket engine for those who missed the beginning. And we wanted to have a fireside chat. So, you know, when you want to go to the moon, you should bring a rocket engine. It's from a <laughs> local Silicon Valley startup that's hoping to get the space this weekend coming up. Um, not one I'm invested in, but one that I am supporting and cheering for. Uh, yes, it is a real fire. Um, we will also, I love my Model 3. It's obviously off topic. Um, but I <laughs> encourage everyone to try one. And um, maybe, uh, yeah, you, you, you actually actually happen to hit that bottom question about product market fit. So perhaps, um, I'm trying to think, are there any of those that you wanted to grab that we didn't cover yet? Because otherwise I wanted to ask you something completely different. Um, yeah, I think we pretty much talked about uh, many of these. I think that um, um, one area that, um, <coughs> um, you know, we sort of wanted to uh, talk about is, uh, again, on this theme of community building, um, um, one thing that we do internally in our culture is sort of have this um, teacher learner model. Um, you know, so we have our kind of world famous interns <laughs> uh, and we spend a lot of time talking about blockchain. Every Tuesday we have a reading circle where we just talk about blockchain papers and we try and get smarter on, on blockchain. So um, in, so, in some ways, you know, uh, we're trying to be a little bit like humble with our approach um, and we really want to kind of engage, uh, engage the community. And we're not necessarily trying to say that, you know, we're the smartest people in the world here, but blockchain is an incredible and phenomenal substrate for incentives. I would argue that Bitcoin works. I mean, I, I sometimes call myself a little bit of like a, a Bitcoin maximalist and that was a bit of a controversial term, but that's only because, you know, sort of like, like many people, my first experience in blockchain was Bitcoin. And so there's a certain kind of like, you know, romance to the design of that. And the second you kind of like grok what uh, the aims were and how it actually worked in practice, you know, some strange like neural pathways end up forming and firing. Um, and so it's less to be like kind of, political or where you're wading into this whole Ethereum altcoin type thing. But, you know, it truly is, you know, a beautiful piece of technology and it truly is a beautiful system. But let's be honest, even the strongest Bitcoin maximalists among us would probably concede that it's not a particularly elegant distributed system. Mm -hmm. uh, proof of work is like a, I would say it's like a big dirty hammer. <laughs> um, and, you know, it's not particularly elegant in terms of mathematical properties. It has like probabilistic finality. It's not even guaranteed to come to consensus. Um, I mean, there's the, you just go down the list. It's terrible for the environment with a list of, anyway, and there's ASICs involved and uh, centralization, but that, that that's all fine. But uh, the reality is it works because of incentives. Incentives is the piece that people miss. And, you know, a lot of times academics come up with like great new uh, consensus protocols or great new technology or scalability, whatnot, or infrastructure, but sort of incentives is the thing that makes all of them go. And so we just think that like more people should be working on the incentive problem. Um, and so that's, Kind of why we named the company on set too actually something this does remind me to be the one last question uh, that i think is special given your background again this unusual combination of experiences having worked at a statistical arbitrage firm like the shaw and working on quantitative you know day trading if you will and high frequency modeling what do you make of that in the crypto space there's been a number of funds forming um which yeah. to me just my first reaction is 
where is there enough liquidity to pull something like this off? And what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, uh, obviously this speaks uh, close to my heart being a, a kind of a, an ex statistical arbitrage trader and kind of seeing every trick in the book on Wall Street. Um, and it's sort of like sometimes it's sort of like the more things change, the more things kind of say the same. Um, and, um, you know, I would actually say just in my judgment, uh, being a stat arbitrator, that there actually is no alpha or outperformance systematically to be gained in investing in stat arb funds in crypto. Uh, you know, that might be a bit of a controversial statement, but uh, you definitely hit one nail on the head as liquidity. Um, you know, if you look at volumes in the space, just from a technical standpoint, um, you know, <clears throat> oftentimes those volumes are misleading. Uh, you know, as the old expression goes, volume is what you see, but liquidity is what you get. Uh, and what you really care about is your exit liquidity. And all of volume and liquidity, it goes into one statistical model, and that is your essentially transaction costs when you need to liquidate. And so a better model is, what do I think the probability of having to liquidate the trade is times the transaction cost that I'm going to occur on the day that I need to liquidate. And that's kind of an unbounded in crypto. Um, I would actually also say that, you know, a lot of the fees out there are kind of absurd, almost usurious, uh, especially given the uh, um, uh, uh, bid offer spreads. Most investors are probably better off just holding Bitcoin with zero fees. Uh, and there are custody solutions for institutions as well uh, that are getting better to the extent that that needs to be something that's a custodied process. Uh, but there's many, many reasons why statistical arbitrage just isn't there right now in crypto. Uh, there's been a lot made about uh, exchanges. Um, and uh, I know that there's a decentralized exchange panel that's obviously very topical with Bancor, which has its own um, you know, issues with decentralized exchanges and how centralized really are these things if you offer sort of uh, certain types of functionality. But I mean, uh, the exchange market is designed to essentially exploit insider information. Um, and so the reality is insider information is rampant uh, in this space. Um, and so, you know, I think we all need to grow up as a market. I mean, either this is going to become a institutionalized market that's credible for capital formation or it's going to be a den of asymmetric insider information. It can't be both. Um, so I think anyone with a vested interest in the long-term interest of institutionalizing and building this out into a real market should be very, very cognizant of the issue. And um, again, I would be, be very, very wary of anyone uh, trying to traffic a stat arb fund uh, in crypto. I've been pitched them before uh, and these sort of black boxes in this space for many, many reasons that are even more technical to get into here. And you think about stat arb, right? It's sort of like you're trying to make a weighted roulette wheel. Uh, and the reality is there aren't enough independent bets that you can make in crypto uh, to make that wheel spin enough times. If you have a casino that has a roulette wheel that you only get to spin once a day, that's not a very good business model. StatR requires lots and lots of independent bets. And the reality is there just aren't enough li liquid independent bets that you can make out there in crypto on an institutional basis. I'm noticing our host has popped back on, which I think is our signal. All right. That our time is, done. is that a fa safe assumption? Uh, that we yeah. And I just want to thank both of you for being here. You know, the audience and I learned a lot about what you're up to here. And, and I think it's a super inspiring. In fact, one of our audience members said uh, that he thought this is his favorite session so far at Hack Summit, that these guys really get the why of the blockchain and they're able to help us understand it as well. And so I think you guys are really onto something. And, you know, we really hope that that the, the market networks, the incentive networks that you build out in the future will really help people to solve problems and and uh, and help humanity in, in ways that we can't even imagine today. And so Steve and, and KK, we really want to acknowledge you for being here. We know how busy both of you are and for choosing Hack Summit as the venue to launch this. Thanks so much for being here. Really appreciate your time. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. I, I really appreciate the opportunity and thanks to everyone in Encent Nation. To the moon. <laughs> to the moon. And we'll be right back, guys, with the team from Cadena who's building a scalable, high-end blockchain for businesses with the first human-readable smart contract language. We'll be right back, guys. Staying here, not going to want to miss it. Three of their leadership team members are here with us together. So thanks again, guys. We'll see you soon. Thank you.